Amen, amen. Wow, wow, wow. Go ahead and uh, pull out your Bibles. Something to take notes with this morning. Is anybody radically encouraged? Good, me too. I love church. This is fun. This is fun. Well, uh, Heather preached last week. Were you here? Okay, the rest of you, you missed out. I'm sorry, but you did. But the good news is it's on YouTube and podcast, and you ought to go check it out. She's my favorite preacher, and she did a great job. Um, what did I say? Pull out your Bibles. Yeah, yeah, I said that. Okay, go ahead and open up to 1 Samuel chapter 16, and also open up to Exodus chapter 20. I know it's confusing, but you're smart people. You can figure it out. 1 Samuel 16, Exodus chapter 20. We're going to continue uh, the series that Heather started last week called Live It. Really excited to share with you this morning. We spent the month of January as a church talking about our word from God for the year that we believe he has spoken to us as a people and as a church. And it's out of Isaiah 54 two. Does anybody shout what it is? Wow. That is incredibly discouraging. But thank you, wife. Yeah, the kids know. Does anybody know what our word is for the year? <laughs> I mean, we talked about it for a month. Well, we're going to talk about it more this year because we need it reinforced. No, but we're, we believe God's spoken the word over us out of Isaiah 54. Do not hold back. God is calling us and God is calling you to be a part of his kingdom right here, right now in your life. And we talked all month about things that make us hold back and how none of them are legit and we just need to go for it with what God's calling us to. So I, if you're new with us, I really encourage you to go uh, check out that series online. Uh, God, is, God is doing something, and uh, we're excited to explore it all year long. Do not hold back. And so we spent January talking about how God is calling us to not hold back, and we want to spend February doing this series called Live It because uh, I don't want to just get excited in January and then spend February through December doing nothing with it. I don't want to get to December and look back and be like, oh, yeah, that was exciting back in January. But then we just kind of did life as normal. And the fact is that as we do not hold back, as we step into the things that God is calling us to, uh, passion is good and passion will get you going, but it won't keep you going a lot of times. And so we want to talk about what are tools, kingdom tools that God has given us to build his kingdom. If you need to drive in a nail, you need a hammer. If you want to build the kingdom of God, you need the tools of the kingdom of God. And so we're talking about what do we need in our life if we want to live it, if we want to not hold back and make it for the long haul. Because this isn't just a 2019 word, it's the call of God on your life to be a part of his kingdom. And so Heather shared a message with us last week about the Bible called 3D Bible. Did you love it or did you love it? So encouraged. She shared about how, you know, sometimes we read the Bible like you would watch a 3D movie without the glasses. Like if you don't have the glasses on, it's all fuzzy and it's kind of hard to follow. You got to have the right, you got to have the right lens if you're going to get everything out of the movie. And this is true about the word of God. For so many of us, we look at the Bible and we see it two-dimensional when it's meant to be three-dimensional. And we can look at it and we get discouraged and it's foggy and fuzzy and it's kind of hard to follow. And we see it as just historical or just instructional as those two dimensions, but it's three-dimensional. The third dimension is that the word of God is relational. And God wants to be in relationship with you through his word. And if we can look at it through that lens, it's going to jump off the page like the dinosaurs of Jurassic Park. So it's a little summary for you. Go hear the rest of it because the rest of it was really good. And this morning I'm excited to continue our series uh, here in 1 Samuel chapter 16. I hope you're ready for a word from God today. I hope you came hungry. It's been a good morning in church, but it's not done yet. And uh, we believe church is a participation sport, which is why I've been asking you so many questions this morning and why you've been participating. So don't leave me up here alone. Uh, talk back. Thank you, Natasha. Shout Amen. <laughs> You might need to stand up because God's moving, and if you need to move a little bit with him, you're allowed to move. Say, is this is a move, anybody. This is a move. 1 Samuel 16, we're going to read a handful of verses here. Before we get going, we're going to re be reading about a guy named David. A guy named David this morning. And if you're new to the Bible or you're new to church, David is a big character in history. He's a big character in the Bible. He's a big character in our faith. And I'm going to give you a little bit of background as we jump into it. David grew up as a shepherd boy. He has seven older brothers. And he's growing up in the, the, as among the people of Israel, which is the people of God. There's a king over Israel at that time. His name is Saul. And uh, Saul wasn't shaping up to be a very good king. And so God was looking to replace Saul. 
And uh, we're going to start reading in 1 Samuel 16, verse 14. But the, in the first 14 verses that we're skipping over this morning, uh, God tells his prophet Samuel that, he is, that God has found the man that he wants to replace Saul with, and it's David. And so he sends Samuel to anoint this shepherd boy as the next king of Israel. When Samuel comes to his father's house, comes to David's father's house, and says, let me, let me see your sons and see which one God's calling. His father, uh, David's father, Jesse, doesn't even consider David. He just leaves him out in the field tending the sheep. And he brings all the good-looking seven older brothers. And the, the prophet looks at all of them and says, nope, not this one. And God says, nope, not this one. And he says, there's got to be another one. And so he's like, yeah, okay, there's a little boy out in the, shepherd, out in the field, so we'll go get him. So they go grab David. Samuel anoints David uh, in oil to be the next king. Scholars think he's about 15 years old. Imagine that. Coming out of the fields, you're just shepherding, you know, like you're the youngest, and all of a sudden you're going to be this next king of Israel. So he's anointed king, but what David doesn't know at this time is that he's got a long road between that anointing as king and being appointed as king. And I hope that's encouraging for anybody who feels like you're in between something this morning. Because God's anointed you for some things, and there's some things on your life, and there's some things in you, but you don't feel like they can get out. And right after David gets anointed, he gets sent right back out into the fields. And that's interesting. That's interesting. But that's where we pick up David. He's just been anointed. He's been sent out into the field. Some time has passed. And we pick up the story back in the palace with Saul. Is everybody in the palace? All right, we're good. Let's read a few verses here starting in verse 14. I've been fighting the same cold Heather was. Apparently we, maybe we kissed or something. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Verse 14. Now, the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servant said to him, Behold, now a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre, or like the harp. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it, and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me a man who can play well, and bring him to me. One of the young men answered, Behold, I've seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence. And the Lord is with him. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me David, your son, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat, and he sent them by David, his son, to Saul. And David came to Saul, and he entered his service. And Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre, and he played it with his hand, so that Saul was refreshed, and he was well, and a harmful spirit departed from him. David has found his first entry into the palace, not by his anointing, but by his harp playing. Very interesting. And I want to preach a message to you this morning. Write this at the top of your page. Live it, part two. Title in this, War and Worship. War and Worship. David had a lot going for him. We read that Saul is having a hard time. His servants are so annoyed with Saul and this thing that's going on with him that they're like, hey, let us help you out. Let us find somebody who can help you. And he says, okay, find me somebody. And one of his servants speaks up and says, I know of a guy. And he starts talking about David and he lists off all these things that David has going for him. He's good looking. He can talk real well. He can fight. He's brave. But somehow all of this has left him in a field. Like we said, sometimes you've got stuff in you that your situation doesn't show you. Sometimes there's some things in you that your situation isn't, isn't showing. And I don't have time to go into that, but if you were encouraged by it, it was for you. One of the things that the servant tells Saul about David is that he is a man of war. He's a man of war. And if you look at the rest of the very long story of, of David's road to the throne and even just the rest of his life, you see that David was indeed a man of war. This dude knew what he was doing on the battlefield. Not only could he fight, he could lead, he could gather, he could train. This dude was a beast. And if you read through his story, you'll see battles, you see triumphs and victories and conquests, incredible Incredible, legendary stories, like one on 300 verse, you know, kind of stuff. It's wild. He's a legend. And, 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 and the, over the course of his life, as he goes from the shield or from the field to the throne, a lot of 
if you read through the story, a lot of his promotions along the way come on the heels of these victories. They, they come on the backs of the songs of the nation, of the admiration of the people. They see him conquer something. They see him accomplish something in war. And so they promote him closer and closer to the throne until he is, in fact, king. And if you read the story, it'll look like it was his ability in war that won him the throne. It'll look like it was his ability in war that made him king. And if you would have asked the people of, the, of Israel, the people who now are his subjects, if you would have asked them, why is David the king? Why is he so awesome? Why do you love him so much? What, what was it that helped him along the road from the, 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 shep, the sheep field to the throne? And they would tell you the same thing. They would start telling you legendary stories of this guy at war, this guy in the field, because this guy's a man of war. That's why he's our king. But God didn't make David king because he could win wars. In chapter 16, verse 7, I mentioned the story where Samuel is looking for the next king. And David's going, or God is going one by one on his brother saying, no, no, no. He looks good, but no. He sounds good, but no, 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 no. And Samuel's getting discouraged. And God says something to him in uh, 1 Samuel 16, 7. And, and we got to remember, if we're going to see this rightly, what it is that God said. He said, I don't see as man sees. He says, man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Saying, Samuel, I know he looks good, but I don't see the way you're seeing. I see the heart. See, if God needed somebody to win wars, he wouldn't have even needed to go looking for David. Saul could win wars too. You look at Saul's life, he was pretty good at conquering cities. And mainly because he was leading God's people, so God's on their team, so God gets done what God needs done. And Saul gets to ride the wave. But back in 1 Samuel 13, three chapters before our story, in verse 14, we actually hear a story of Saul, and he's just won a war. He's just won a battle. He's just taken over a city. But he didn't respond to the victory the way that the Lord wanted him to respond. And it's this bizarre story where Saul has been king. He takes the Lord's victory, but then doesn't honor the Lord with it. And so the Lord comes to Saul and says, it's over. The kingdom is departing from you. He says this in verse 14 of chapter 13, 1 Samuel 13, 14. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be the prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. The Lord looks at the heart. Saul was good at winning wars, but he wasn't any good at worship. And I want to talk to you about your worship this morning. If you want to make it for the long haul, there's a place for war, but you've got to worship. God said, I have sought out. I have sought out. It's a purposeful statement. I have sought out. I have a purpose to accomplish. And I need the right person for this purpose. I can't just pick anybody. i got to find the right somebody. And I'm going to diligently and intentionally, I'm going to search. I'm going to seek out the right person until I find him. He tells Saul, I have sought out. I have sought out a man after my own heart. There are plenty of men who are after promotion. Plenty of men who are after success. Plenty of men who are after pleasure. Every man is after something. Every woman is after something. But what David had that God needed was a heart that was after God. I found a man who is after my own heart. God sees David. He says he's good looking. But I'm better looking. I don't need that. He can speak real well, but I can speak for myself. I don't need that. He's strong, but I'm stronger, and I don't need that. What he's got is a heart that's after my heart. What David had was a heart after God. David had set his heart on the Lord. Like a bloodhound catches a scent and goes after it, David's heart was after the heart of God. He knew how to pursue a giant with a slingshot. And he knew how to pursue the Lord with a heart. He was after the heart of God. He knew how to pursue God with his worship. You are made for war. You are called to war. You are in a war. Not a carnal war with flesh where our weapons are of flesh and blood. Our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual powers and dark forces and principalities of this age. You are in a war. 
And your strengths, your gifts, your talents, your passions are all weapons for the kingdom of God. You are equipped. You've been called. You've been equipped for war. But there's no weapon like your worship. Every other weapon God has given you is to defeat your enemies, but your worship is to defeat yourself. Your worship is God's weapon to you to defeat your self. Yourself. See, what I'm trying to say is that the devil can't derail you from your calling, but your desires can. Come on, somebody. Some of the things that have derailed you in the past, you blamed on the devil, but it was undisciplined desires. And if we want to make it, we need a weapon against our, our self. I'm not saying you're not worth anything. I'm just saying there's some desires that aren't going to help you. <laughs> and it's not even always about getting rid of certain desires. It's mainly just about prioritizing them. Worship isn't just about music at a church service on Sunday morning. Worship is about pointing your desire, the desire of your heart, after the heart of God. And I want to ask you this morning, what are you after? What are you after? Because everybody's worshiping something. You are worshiping something. Don't think that you're not good at worship just because the music on Sunday mornings isn't your thing and there's people that raise their hands higher than you and shout louder than you and dance more than you. Don't, don't start thinking worship's not your thing. You're, worship, you're worshiping something. What I'm trying to say is your heart is after something. Your heart is after something. And, and worship isn't about pretending like, you know, nothing's going on and we just get to pretend like there's nothing happening in the world and we just get to listen to soft music with our eyes closed all day and that's what God's looking for. David wasn't idle. David wasn't lazy. He wasn't a worshiper because he didn't do anything. He was a man of valor. He was a man of war. He was a shepherd. He knew how to fight off bears and lions. He knew how to lead a nation. He knew how to raise an army. He knew how to take a battlefield. He knew how to rule the nation and build the people of God. This man had stuff to do, and yet he was still a worshiper. It's not about doing nothing because worship isn't defined by what you're doing. It's the desire behind what you're doing. Don't get legalistic about judging, well, I can't do this like a real worshiper. It's not about what you do. What are you desiring when you do what you do? God isn't looking for what you can do for him. God's looking for your desire for him. What's your heart after this morning? What's your heart after? Excuse me. Time out. Talk amongst yourselves. Sometimes you got a runny nose and an itchy throat, you know? Don't act like you ain't been there. <laughs> Did you open up to Exodus 20? Go ahead and flip over there. You're going to turn left for those of you new to the Bible. Genesis, Exodus. And then once you get to Exodus, it's 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 20, and you'll get there. Exodus chapter 20. Oh, I should turn there too. 1, 2, 13, 15, 18, 20. Did I beat anybody? No. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, there's a lot going on in Exodus chapter 20. You don't have time to get into it. But there's something happening that you've heard of before called the Ten Commandments. Anybody familiar, heard of the Ten Commandments? All right, good. We don't need to go into the background too much. We get the Ten Commandments here in Exodus chapter 20. And I think we can have an interesting relationship sometimes with the Ten Commandments because it's in the Old Testament. And like, you know, we're under grace and in the New Covenant, not under the law. But these are kind of like really good rules. <laughs> And so, like, what do we do with them, right? Like, we're a New Testament church, and that's the law, and, we're, and God didn't, God, or Jesus didn't uh, take away the law. He fulfilled it, so does that mean it apply or not? Like, are these still good? Are we still allowed to read the Old Testament? Like, what do we do with all this stuff? I'm not the only one with an interesting relationship at times with the Old, okay. What the Ten Commandments are, <clears throat> when God, God is 
clearly putting into words 10, 10 principles and 10 commandments that, that govern existence. And what we have to understand, what I think will help us with, especially zeroing in on the Ten Commandments and, and how we interact with them, is they're still legit today, is what I want to tell you. God's still talking to us through the Ten Commandments. We, should, we ought to still keep the Ten Commandments. They're not, they're not gone. They're not nullified. Jesus said, I fulfilled them. I didn't get rid of them. And, and what I want to help understand is, like, God's perspective when he was giving the Ten Commandments wasn't that these were necessarily novel ideas. It wasn't like, oh, murder's bad, but now it's wrong. Murder was never helpful, right? Like Genesis 4, Cain kills Abel. It was bad then. That was before the law, right? So what God's doing is he's, he's trying to give us language for things that are already true, eternal truths about how existence that he created works out, okay? I heard somebody put it this way this one time. It was so beautiful. If you read Exodus 18, 19, and 20, and even the, the, the many chapters to come, what's really helpful is if you look at it as a wedding ceremony. If you look at it as, as a wedding ceremony between God and his people, that these, are, these aren't just rules or like arbitrary, like jump through these hoops or here's something novel that you didn't know, like stealing is bad. And it's like, wow, you know. What, what, what God's doing is he's saying like he's making, he's in the middle of making covenant with his people. And say, we're going to be in relationship together. And so now if we're going to live together, here's how the house works that I created. There's some, there's, some, there's some boundaries, some clarity that I want to give you. And so what I'm trying to say is that the Ten Commandments are still good to follow, right? The thing about grace is, grace doesn't make them go away. Grace doesn't make them irrelevant. The fact that we're under grace means we actually have the power to keep them. Now, I said grace now gives you the power to keep them. Grace isn't an excuse not to follow God. It's the power to follow God. Now that you've got grace, you can say no to sin. You can say yes to righteousness. Now that you've got grace, it's not about living free and just asking for forgiveness later. It means you've got the righteousness of Christ now, and you're free from all these things. I could preach all day until somebody says amen. I mean, come on. Like, I don't know about you, but I got saved. Come on. So grace, grace empowers us to do it, and then it means we have forgiveness when we screw it up. Anybody ever done that part too? So that's how I want to help us with our relationship with the Ten Commandments. So now we can jump into them. Was that helpful for anybody? So they're still good. They're still true. When God wrote these things down, the, the right things didn't become right, and the wrong things didn't become wrong. He's just giving us language for these things that are eternal truths about who he is. And as we jump into these Ten Commandments, I mean Ten, like... Of all the things, like here's 10 that God's rock solid on, the first 40% are about worship. Four of the 10 and the first four of the 10 are about your worship. God is getting at something. And there's some eternal truths here about our worship. If we want to make it, we got to worship. And God is landing it out for us. I want to go through these four. In Exodus 20, verse 3, God says this, you shall have no other gods before me. Can I talk about worship this morning? You shall have no other gods before me. The word gods that is used there is the word, uh, the Hebrew word Elohim. We're going to talk about some Hebrew this morning, make you think I'm smart. Blueletterbible.com, I'm telling you. It'll make you feel like you're a genius. Elohim is the word. It's a word that is translated gods, but it's not just a word that means God. It's actually a common name for God. So people had taken just kind of how you would uh, take the, the word God and somehow it can be lowercase. When you uppercase it, you're talking about that's, that's the name of our God. That's God. That's what, how Elohim was. And so this is, this is a big word for the people. And God's saying, you shall have no other God before me. And it doesn't just mean, this word Elohim doesn't just mean like a divine uh, deities and all of that kind of stuff. Some practical words that I think are really helpful in applying to our worship is this, this word could be used to be translated rulers or judges. You shall have no other rulers before me. You shall, no other, you shall have no other judges before me. See, the truth is that your life is being steered and determined by the God that your heart is after. God's first commandment, don't set your heart, don't set your life after any other judge, after any other ruler. Okay, well, we're going to go to work on this one, all right? We're going to get these dots connected, I know. What I'm trying to say is that God's not telling you don't have any other gods before me because he's insecure. 
He knows who he is, all fine and well. God doesn't need a reminder that he's God, you do. That's what worship is really all about. God knows. Do you? Do you know who your God is? See, the command that he gives us, don't have any other gods before me. It's about setting up the reminder for you and the reminder for me that we need. And he's saying that uh, he's given this command not to box us in, but actually to save us. Because any other rulers whose boundaries you try to follow are going to kill you. Nobody else is looking out for you. No other ruler you can follow. No other boundaries you can try to fit your life into. No other judge who you can look for their approval is actually really looking out for you. So he's saying, don't follow after any other ruler. Don't submit your life to any other ruler. It's not going to take you where you want to go. Don't, don't give your life searching and working for the approval of any other judge. Let me be your judge. Only I can give you the approval that you're looking for. So the question is, whose rules are you living by? Whose approval are you living for? Is there a God before the one true God? Psalm 16, 11, it says that you have shown me the paths of life. He says the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Can I just say praise God for boundaries in my life? Anybody thankful for some lines on the road? Anybody thankful for some traffic lights that turn red and green at the same time? Anybody thankful that you know to stay on the right and not on the left? Is there anybody thankful for boundaries in your life? It's not legalistic, it's life. God's setting, setting you in life. And just because the rules may be uncomfortable doesn't mean it's not good for you. Don't have any other ruler before me. Only the Lord can set boundaries for you in your life in pleasant places. And there is only one judge who will judge you according to grace. Every other judge that you will ever try to stand in front of and live for the approval of will judge you according to your deeds. And God steps in. He gives you his very own righteousness and says, I'll judge you according to that. <laughs> Let me become your sin so you can become my righteousness and then we'll talk. Come on, somebody. Who else is going to do that for you? Who else can give you that? Don't go chasing after something that's going to fail you. Don't go chasing after something that's going to destroy you. Don't have any other God before me. Worship the Lord. He goes on, chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water or under, uh, that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. Everybody say bow down. Or serve, or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. God's getting after your worship. He says, don't you go making any other images and bow down and serve them. Don't bow down to them and don't serve them. Don't bow down to them. Don't, don't have reverence for any other God. Before me. Don't show honor. Don't, don't submit your life to anything other than me. And don't go working for anybody else either. Don't, don't go bow down and don't go serving. Don't make yourself a servant of any other master. Who are you working for? Who are you giving your time to? Who are, giving, who are you giving your energy to? What are you putting in your effort towards? Don't make another image. Don't chase another thing. Don't bow down and worship. There's no sugarcoating this stuff, huh? And I'm thankful for that. Sometimes sugar's real nice, and sometimes it's not good for you. And this is one of those things God just comes in so clear because he wants to set us free. He said, let's just be straight so you can't miss it. He is a jealous God. He is a jealous God. And what that means is the, the, the facts are he goes on here and he explains that, that when, you, when you hate God, you're choosing to become an enemy. But if you'll align with him and love him, to his enemies, he goes to four generations of, of chasing in their iniquity. And he'll hold you accountable. And he'll, he'll, he'll hold you accountable and visit the iniquity of generations. But he says, if you just come under me, I'm talking thousands of generations. Like, it's endless. This never ends. You don't earn it. Just love me and step under the blessing to the thousandth generation. He's saying, I'm a jealous God. This is, this is just how it works, and you need to know it. 
He's not setting up a line that says, now if you don't follow this, I don't like you. What he's trying to say is that here are the rules, and when you're coming against this, I want to paint a clear picture for you. You're not just doing what you want to do. You are choosing to step on the other side of the battle line and turn around and face me and say, let's roll. Don't do it, guys. Don't do it. Don't face up like that. You don't want to do that. Romans chapter 5, it says, when we, it says, when we were enemies of God, he died for us. But we were enemies of God. Colossians chapter 1 says that when we were away from him, we were alienated from him and hostile towards God. Sin isn't just behavior. It's not just actions. God's not waiting for you to jump through hoops. The problem is when we're not aligned with God, we are choosing hostility towards him. And as a good king, he must take down the things that threaten his kingdom. And you are the ones who are in it. He must care for you. He must care for his people. He must establish justice and fight against injustice. How could he be good if he did not hold anybody accountable for what was done when it breaks and hurts people? It is by grace we are saved, but we've got to get in the grace of God. If we choose hostility, don't be frustrated when you go to war. Don't bow down and don't serve any other God. Because I would love for you to live in a thousand generations of blessing. This is what's on the other side, guys. Like, which one do you want? Like, don't you, it's just nice when he makes it clear. It's like, you can eat this. I just dug it up from the trash dump. Or, I don't know, whatever it is that you like. It's an easy choice. When you show reverence, when you submit to something else, when your life is working and laboring in pursuit of the approval of something other than God, you are fighting and you're working to build something other than God. You're, you're fighting and working to build a different kingdom. And God is on a mission to establish his kingdom. You alienate yourself from him. You separate yourself from him. You become and choose to be an enemy of God. And the fact is he doesn't mess around with his enemies. But he does give grace. He says, when you love me and you keep my commandments, when you bow down and serve me, thousands of blessings. A thousand generations. What he's saying to you wedding ceremony, the vow to the bride. You don't have to waste your life anymore chasing other things. You don't have to waste your life showing reverence to worthless things, working for God and they can't give you what you're looking for. We're together now. So don't go running off. I mean, we all did it at our weddings. We did the same thing, right? Hey, there's no reason to go cheat on me. We're good, right? Verse 7 of Exodus 20, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes the name in vain. Vain. Don't take the name of the Lord in vain. I know they're coming, it's all good. Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Vain, this word, it means emptiness. Don't take up his name in emptiness or vanity or falsehood, in emptiness of speech or worthlessness of action. What he's saying is, he's not just saying, don't say OMG. That's not what this commandment is all about. You know, like, like that, that's not the extent of it. He's saying, don't lift up my name in emptiness. Don't lift up my name in worthlessness of action. Don't do it for show. If you lift up my name for show to others, it's doing nothing for you. And in fact, it's like something to be guilty of. Like you're doing it for show, like you're going to use my name, like the name, to impress somebody else. We don't play like that. Don't do it for show to God. Don't start worshiping with no intention of actually honoring him with your life. Don't come to church and raise your hand and say, God, see, look how much I love you, and think he doesn't see the rest of it. And I'm not talking about how you got to be perfect. I'm trying to talk about putting on a show. There's a big difference between trying and not trying, but still putting on a show. Come on, somebody. Are we good? I know we're shooting it straight, but I'm thankful because the truth will set you free. He says, don't lift up my name in vain. Don't play, for, don't play God for a fool by worshiping with your hands up but not trying to give him your life. Nothing in your heart. He's not a fool. This isn't a game, he's saying. This isn't empty religion anymore. You don't have to lift up my name in emptiness. It's not lip service or jumping through hoops. He's saying you don't need to sing your songs thinking your songs will save you. You don't need to go to church thinking church will save you. You don't need to do religion thinking religion will save you. He's saying my name has some meaning to it. My name's got something in it. 
My name is truth. It's the name above every other name. When you speak the name, believe for the power of the name. When you ask the name to move in your life, believe in the power of the name. When you lift up the name of the Lord, expect the Lord to show up and do what the Lord does. Don't think it doesn't matter when you worship. Don't think it doesn't matter when you pray. Don't think it doesn't matter when you honor him with your life, with your decisions, with your waiting, with your integrity, with your character. Your worship is not in vain, so go ahead. Go ahead and worship. Go ahead and lift up some praise. Go ahead and lift up your hands. Go ahead and shout with your voice. Go ahead and stir up your faith. Go all in. Go for it. I wish you would believe in this name. Everything you've got because your God is alive. Your God is good. Your God is present. And I wish you would lift up the name of the Lord. That you wouldn't lift up empty praise. Because when you lift up the name of the Lord, you get the Lord. Don't lift up my name in vain. I want your worship. And 8 through 11, he says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, or your livestock, or your sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven, and the Lord made earth, the sea, and all that is in them. And he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. I know this might be a little weird to start talking about the Sabbath and worship. But there's an area of your faith that can only be tested and activated and experienced in rest. I got two people writing that down. There's an area of your faith that can only be tested. It can only be activated. It can only be experienced in rest. More often than not, it takes risk to rest. It's hard to say no. It's hard to stop. It's hard to not do that one more thing. I'm not talking about laziness, but you're not lazy people, so we don't need to talk about that. I'm talking about rest. It's not passive. It's actual, it takes faith to rest in God. To do all that you can do in six days and then take a day to rest. For real. For real. And it's not just about rest. It's about rest, but, but it's not just about doing nothing and chilling out. Though that's important to stop. But it's not just about that. Later on in the book of Exodus, in chapter 31, verses 12 through 13. I don't know if I gave you the right verses, but so I'll just read it here. God's talking more about this Sabbath, and he says, And the Lord said to Moses, You are to speak to the people of Israel and say, Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. What he's saying is rest isn't just for the body. It was a reminder for the spirit. I want you to have a rhythm in your life of a whole day where you can't accomplish a thing and you just sit there and remember when you're not working for me, when you're not getting anything done for me, when you're not getting anything done for yourself, you remember God takes care of me. You got nothing of your own to, to, to lean back on and say, yeah, but I got this. Yeah, but I did this. He's like, not that day, and I still love you just the same. You need to rest to remind your spirit of the grace of God. When you can't do anything, God still gives grace. Your rest is a reminder that you're saved by grace. He says, this will be a reminder to you that it's me who sanctifies you. Sabbath is a worship. It's laying everything down that you hold on to for your identity, for your healing, for your provision. And you sit back and you fall back into the arms of a good father. And you say, I trust you. You are my provider. You are my salvation. You are my breakthrough. You are my sanctification. Lord, it is you that takes care of me. I want you to live your life not holding back. I want you, I want you to live this out. I want you to live what God's calling you to. And if you want to live it, you got to win the war of your worship. you got to win the war of your worship. Because there is a war over your worship. There's a war over your desires. It's not about how high you can jump, but sometimes you got to jump to get the desires in line with what you're telling them to do. There's a war over your worship, and you got to win that war if you want to make it for the long haul. Would you stand as we close this morning? I bet you couldn't guess it, but we're going to worship as we close. We're going to close our time worshiping, and, and, and I, want, I want you to worship and let the devil know what your heart's after. 
I want you to worship and let heaven know what your heart is after this morning. I want you to make a declaration, make a demonstration. This is what my heart is after. There's questions in your life. There's needs in your life. There's highs and there's lows. But will you set your heart on the Lord? Will you set your heart after the heart of God? In the midst of all of it, we got to worship. In the midst of the journey, in the midst of the long road ahead, and the questions and the not knowing, and the wondering and the needs, we're going to worship our God. We're going to lift up the name of our Lord. And as we worship, we're going to have our prayer team off to the sides like we always do. And I want to encourage you, if you need something this morning, go get some prayer. Let some people pray for you. Don't worry about what anybody thinks about you. It doesn't matter. We're at church. Get what you need in God. Amen. You may need a healing. You may need a miracle. God is always doing things in these moments, even these last few minutes as we finish. Don't be too proud. Don't be too scared. Let God move in your life. But every one of us is responding together right here, right now, making our choice individually so that together we can lift up a joyful noise before the Lord. And we can say, Lord, you're going to have our worship. Right now, today, I don't know what's coming tomorrow, but today I win the war of my worship. I win the war of what the desires of my heart are going after. If you need to respond specifically, please go see somebody pray with you. You might be here this morning and you've never turned your whole worship to Jesus. I want to invite you this morning to give your life to Jesus. Give your life to this grace. Stop chasing and serving all these other things that are trying to fill you, tell you how to live your life, and make you feel good enough about yourself. You need to worship Jesus. You can be free from your sin. You can be free from your bondage. You can be made whole. And the Lord says that you are like born again into this life that we're talking about living. If you want to live your life that God's called you to make it for the long haul, it could start today. It could start today one step at a time. Talk to the person who brought you. Come have somebody pray with you. We really would love to make space for you to encounter the love of Jesus this morning. So for all of us, we're going to do a song we've been doing a lot in the last couple of weeks called I Raise a Hallelujah. Because I don't know about you, but I will raise a hallelujah. Amen. Jesus, we love you this morning. We choose to give you our worship and our praise. Though we're asking that as we praise you, your name would come. As we lift up your name, we're expecting the power of God. As we bow down to you, Lord, we're expecting your kingdom to come. We're expecting change to break and healing to be brought as we lift up your name. Lord, would you free us from ourselves? Would you turn our desires to you? Would you convict us right now, Holy Spirit, of any other gods, anything else that we're chasing? And would you teach us to set our hearts after the heart of God? In Jesus' name, let's sing this morning.